Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> now I know most of you are thinking, well, we know why you chose that hymn. It has five verses. <laughs> I saw that hand down there. <laughs> and that gives me time to run to the balcony and all the way back down and run up to the sound room and all the way back down. But actually, there is another reason. I did choose that particular one among the resurrection hymns because it had five verses. But uh, nonetheless, because it ties into our text tonight, as does our closing hymn. Please take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 25. Tonight, the Lord willing, we are looking at verses 13 through 21. Acts chapter 25, verses 13 through 21. Now, we've had a good number of interruptions along the way. We had our missions conference with Reverend Eben Yoon, and then we had last week Reverend Hal Ricker, and uh, so uh, we're trying to get to where we are tonight. The last time we were in Acts, we were talking about when should you appeal to the government. Tonight, we're talking about hard cases make bad law. So over the past month, we've examined the key issues that relate to biblical salvation. I hope you can remember that far back. But the key issues that relate to biblical salvation. We saw that there are 16 building blocks of truth that make up the New Testament doctrine of salvation. And if you didn't get those back when we were going through them, it took several weeks to get through that. But if you didn't get those notes, you're going to get a summary tonight, and you could write all 16 of them down on a single sheet of paper, and that way you would have them all, wouldn't you, in case there ever happened to be a test over those in the future. <laughs> Oh, well, you know I like to every now and then give a test, and people who make good grades on tests do get prizes, and uh, those who actually learn Bible doctrine and apply it to life will someday get heavenly rewards. So that's merely a reflection, the prizes that come, merely a reflection of what is yet to come, the very best. So you recall that the first block of truth centered around, these are the truths, the building blocks concerning salvation. The first block of truth centered around the person and work of Christ. And we're going to be focusing in on one of those particular doctrines tonight because it is central to and critical to understanding our text. The person and work of Christ, which the New Testament calls the gospel. We saw that under that first one, this first block of truth, the person and work of Christ, that salvation is found in Jesus, the Messiah, alone. The Jewish Messiah, who is the descendant of both Abraham and David. This salvation results in forgiveness and cleansing from sin. This salvation is eternal. It is tangible and visible because it changes lives, and it is unique. There is no other way of heaven. It results in obedience to Christ. So the first block of truth centers around the person and work of Christ. Those were all things that fell under that first category, and we read many verses in relation to that. The second building block of truth shows the scope of salvation. The scope of salvation. That salvation is available both to Jews and to Gentiles. Salvation is available both to Jews and to Gentiles. That's the scope of salvation. By the way, the reason the material I'm summarizing very quickly tonight is important is because it will help you when you share Christ with others. The third block of truth related to salvation deals with the invisible spirit world. It deals with the invisible spirit world. In other words, the demons understand salvation. They know who Jesus is, but they know that they can never be saved. Christ did not die for demons. Christ died for sinful men. The fourth block of truth reveals the speech of those who are saved. The speech of those who are saved. Salvation is a matter of faith that will always result in a confession. True salvation always results in a verbal testimony. Paul says so in Romans 10.10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That is concerning the salvation that you have. Number five, 
the fifth block of truth regarding salvation, shows that salvation applies to the future as well as to the present. That's another one of the key points that we're going to see in our text tonight. Salvation applies to the future as well as to the present. It has eschatological applications and implications. That is, salvation applies to things to come. Number six, the sixth block of truth concerning salvation is the, what I call, the insurmountable nature of salvation. The insurmountable nature of salvation in times of trial. In other words, salvation has practical application to the sufferings of this present time. We're going to see that truth manifested in the text that we look at tonight. The sufferings of the present times. The insurmountable nature of salvation cannot be destroyed by what you go through now. The seventh block of truth concerning salvation, and this is what we saw in the preceding passages in the pre previous chapter, chapter 24. The seventh block is the danger of delaying salvation. The danger of delaying salvation. You remember, we just looked at it, Felix delayed salvation and as a result is in hell today. The eighth block of truth concerning salvation was a warning. Watch out for counterfeit salvations. Watch out for counterfeit salvations. Paul speaks of that in 2 Corinthians 7.10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. It's not just enough to feel sorry that you did something or feel sorry that you got caught. Godly uh, repentance works salvation, not to be repented of. The ninth block of truth concerning salvation relates to, if you need a phrase, the benefits of of salvation. The benefits of salvation. We only gave you a very brief summary of that because I've gone over it in depth in the past. But salvation includes many different works of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. There are some incredible benefits that come with salvation. We've noted that there are at least 39 different works of the Holy Spirit listed in Scripture that come to the believer at the point of salvation and then manifest themselves after salvation. I just remind you of one. I gave you several, but I'll remind you of one. Ephesians 1.13, in whom ye trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. There's the sealing of the Spirit, the earnest of the Spirit, the indwelling of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, they're just innumerable things that come to the believer after he has trusted Christ. Those are benefits of salvation. The tenth great block of truth related to salvation is spiritual victory. This is one the devil doesn't want you to know about, and he certainly doesn't want you to practice. But spiritual victory. Salvation is essential if we want to win the spiritual warfare. Paul speaks of it both in Ephesians 6 and 1 Thessalonians 5. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. And that word hope is a very key word for our message tonight also. The eleventh block of truth concerning salvation is this. And here's one that we like to sort of avoid. Genuine salvation always results in works of righteousness in the life of the believer. Genuine salvation always results in works of righteousness in the life of the believer. Now your works do not save you. We need to make that always very clear. They do not save you, but your works are visible proof of salvation in the life of one who truly believes. The twelfth block, and we looked at many verses on that, the twelfth bedrock block of truth about salvation is this, 
salvation. And this is one that, of course, uh, in every Presbyterian and Reformed church, they love this particular building block. Salvation is a result of the elective purposes of God, not the will of man. You're not saved by your own will. You're saved by the fact that God in eternity past chose certain ones to be saved. You recall verse 2 Thessalonians verses, uh, chapter 2, verse 13, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. The choice comes first, the setting apart by the Spirit comes second, and then finally down the road comes the belief of the truth. That's the twelfth bedrock truth about salvation. The thirteenth foundational block of the truth about salvation is that salvation is a matter of grace and not of works. Salvation is a matter of grace and not of works. There are many verses that we read and studied in relation to that. The fourteenth block of truth about salvation is salvation, and we don't like this one either, salvation demands responsibilities from those who are saved. Salvation demands responsibilities from those who are saved. Nobody gets a free ride after they're saved, even if salvation itself is free. The fifteenth block of truth related to salvation is the matter of eternal security or security for the elect. God uses angels to protect the elect until they are saved. That is a marvelous, wonderful blessing. None of God's elect are ever going to be lost. God guarantees it. He chose them in eternity past. Romans chapter 8 tells us it goes all the way from God's choice in eternity past to glorification if you read the, the last few verses of Romans chapter 8 and there are no leaks along the way. And God uses the angels to keep them safe. Hebrews 1.14 Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? The sixteenth block and the capstone of the truth related to salvation. Ah, and how thankful we are for this because there is a touchstone. There is a place that can always be relied on. And so it's the capstone God uses the scriptures to draw us to Christ. Not human reason, not human argumentation, not emotions, not feelings, not experience. God uses the scriptures to draw us to Christ. 2 Timothy 3.15 And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. The scriptures give us the only reliable record as to who Jesus is and what he did. It is the scriptures that proclaim for us the gospel. It is the scriptures that direct us to the true Christ, the one who died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. Without the scriptures, you have no foundation upon which to base your faith. That is why the Bible is hated in so many parts of the world. Because the devil does not want people to know what God has said about salvation. Suddenly, when they trust Christ, they're out of his control. Which is another of the important points that we're going to be making tonight. Now, last time that we were in Acts, with the various interruptions in between, <laughs> there were a lot of interruptions over the last two and a half months. But last time we were in Acts, you recall, we answer the question, when should you appeal to the government? Because chapter 25, the first 12 verses right before our text tonight, uh, we find that the Apostle Paul appeals to government. It looks like they're going to do him dirty. And so down in verse 10, he says, Then Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. In other words, hey, I'm ready to die if I'm a bad guy. But if I'm not a bad guy, the law doesn't permit you to kill me or turn me over to the, those guys who are going to kill me. 
But if there be none of those things whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. You know, that really let Festus and the rest of the council off the hook. <laughs> they thought, wow, what a great escape. When Festus had conferred with the council, he answered, Hast thou appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar shalt thou go. Man, he's off my plate. Don't have to. He didn't say, I'll give you fair judgment now, Paul, because the Jews probably would not have gone to Rome to confront the Apostle Paul in front of Julius Caesar. They would have been in serious trouble if they did. In fact, we know later in the book of Acts, when Paul gets to Rome, you know, there's nobody that has brought any charges against him there. So Festus and the council are very glad that the Apostle Paul has made that appeal. We saw the clear direction as to when we should appeal to the government for relief, but the first was very obvious. Paul was already a prisoner, so obviously he could appeal. The second obvious case in which Christians can appeal to the government is when there is a higher court that can render an ultimate decision not based on local politics. The third reason why Christians can appeal to the government is when there is a shift in power and outside forces try to reinstate their charges. All of these things we saw in the text. The fourth reason in the text was when a Christian is facing death as the outcome of the lower court decision. The fifth reason when a Christian can appeal to the government is when the Christian perceives that he might get a fairer trial on appeal. The sixth reason in which a Christian can appeal to the government for another trial is when the judge shows that he is willing to listen to bogus, unprovable charges as we saw in verses 7 through 9. It's very clear those are bogus charges because it says they laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. The seventh reason we saw when a Christian can appeal to the government is when you see that the judge really does know the truth, but he's afraid to act on it. Judges are human beings also. The eighth and final reason that we saw in the text was when the legal right of appeal is provided for by law. No sense not to use it. If it's provided for by law and that right cannot be blocked by illegal actions of the plaintiff, the prosecutor, or the judge. And we noted also that it might be good to think about those things in the event that someday you're incarcerated for being a Christian and there is some semblance of legal process by which you can get out of the difficult local situation. Now, of course, in some parts of the world, that's not possible because there is no semblance of legal process that has any form of justice to it. It's all based on false theories, false religions, false doctrines, and merely the fact that you are a Christian already jeopardizes you. But the Roman legal system had a process, and Paul used the process because he was a Roman citizen. Now that brings us tonight. Hard cases make bad law. So beginning in verse 13, And after certain days King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea to salute Festus. And when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause unto the king, saying, There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix. Now Paul's been sitting around for a long time in prison. Not a very fair kind of a thing to happen to a guy. I suspect the Apostle Paul was not wasting his time. He was busy, like Joseph, when he was in prison of witnessing to those around him like Paul and Silas had done back a few chapters earlier and it not only drew other prisoners to Christ because they heard them singing in the prison but it drew the jailer and his family to Christ too when bad things happen it's always with a divine purpose nothing ever comes across your path that God doesn't give you the strength and the grace to bear it's hard for us sometimes when we're going through those difficult situations. But you know, the Bible says that it's true. And that's one of the things that gives us hope. I mentioned a moment ago, that's one of our key themes tonight as we look at this passage here. About whom, when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, desiring to have judgment against him. To whom I answered... It is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die. Before that, he which is accused have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning, here are two key words, the crime laid 
against him. We're in the criminal justice system here when we're talking about Paul. The death penalty was not given by the Romans for a civil offense. The death penalty was given for a criminal offense. The Jews seem to have gotten it messed up concerning what the Old Testament law, the law of Moses, required for the death penalty. They tried to fabricate it. They hated the Lord Jesus Christ and they put him up on the charges and what stuck finally was that charge, destroy this temple and in three days I will rise it again, raise it again. They said, you heard what he said about the temple? But Jesus did in fact raise the temple of his body after three days and we're told in the text that's what he was talking about. Did you know what? That is the key issue with the Jews here in our text tonight. It'll tell us that in a second. But the Jews crucified Jesus and in fact they knew what he was saying. We'll see that in a moment too. They knew what he was saying because of the way they reacted. I get ahead of myself. Criminal offense. Therefore, when they were come hither without delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth. Against whom, when the accusers stood up, they brought none accusation of such things as I supposed. Now here is the issue. Verse 19. But had certain questions against him of their own superstition and of one Jesus which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. <laughs> they didn't like what Jesus said about the resurrection. Even though some of them were Pharisees, they cared more about the temple, that beautiful building that they had, than they did about the truth. Verse 20, and because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him whether he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. Now, if you got the same judge, the change of venue shouldn't make any difference. But the Jews were insistent. We want the trial to take place in Jerusalem. Now, if they're able to put pressure on the judge in a pagan city, what kind of pressure do you think they'd be able to put on him when he is surrounded by the leadership of the Jews and the center of rebellion in Judaism? But you know what? This is a weak man. He's willing to show the Jews a favor and change the venue even though he knows bad things will happen. Verse 21. But when Paul had appealed to be reserved under the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to Caesar. Hard cases make bad law. That's a, an aphorism in the legal circles in which I used to work. Hard cases make bad law. If you start with some wrong premises, you're going to have a hard case. If you start with wrong premises and you've got a hard case, you're going to end up giving a fiat judicial decision which affects the lives of many other people. You think about Roe versus Wade. You think about Obergefell versus Hodges this past year. You think about how that's having an impact, and I mentioned it this morning in the message. You know, Judge Roy Moore was deposed by the federal judiciary years ago because he insisted that it was appropriate to have a monument with the Ten Commandments on it. And they kicked him out. You know what the people did? They reelected him. They put him back in as Chief Justice. They didn't really put him back on the Alabama Supreme Court. Did you know that right now 
they're in the process that they're trying to strip him of his judicial robes because he had the Christian goal to issue an order to the probate judges in every county of Alabama, 67 probate judges, not to perform any same-sex marriages because the probate judges are not under the federal jurisdiction. The probate judges are under the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court of Alabama. And so now they're seeking to depose him again. Hard cases make bad law. When you start with the wrong premises, you end up with hard cases. When you start with the wrong premises, the hard cases, if you don't start with a Christian foundation, always end up with bad law. Judicially imposed law, not law that's made by the legislature, not law that's made by Congress where it's supposed to be made, law made by unelected judges in the federal circuit and then the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, we've got a trial going on. What's the central issue in the trial? The central issue is verse 19, the resurrection. This is always the heart of the matter with a humanistic rationalist. He must not believe it or his house of cards will crumble. It's the nut the pagan evolutionist cannot swallow, the resurrection. It's the roadblock that the materialist cannot get around, the resurrection. It looms like an impending avalanche that will engulf the unbelieving climber on the mountainside. The resurrection. That's why the Jews wanted to kill Paul. Don't let him tell anybody else about the resurrection. You know, Satan has placed blinders on unbelievers on that very critical issue because the resurrection of Christ is the heart of the gospel. We find it given to us in two places, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Dear people, if you don't have this, you have nothing. All the promises of the New Testament are prophesied in the Old Testament. The Jews should have known it. The Pharisees claimed to believe in the resurrection, but when it came to the resurrection of Jesus, and we'll see why in a minute, when it came to the resurrection of Jesus, they would not have it. You can claim to believe something with your mouth when you don't really believe it in your heart. And there are a lot of people sitting in church pews today who claim to believe things with their mouth, but they don't believe them in their heart. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, there's his humanity, and declared to be the Son of God with power, there's his deity, according to the spirit of holiness, what is the proof that he is God the Son, that he is who he said he was? Here it is, by the resurrection from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you, the gospel. Remember, we were talking about the gospel of salvation. We had those 16 building blocks that I gave you just a moment ago. Here's the heart of what Paul preached, and here's why Paul got into trouble. I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand. A man or woman, boy or girl, who knows the truth of the gospel can go through all kinds of things and never crack. By which also ye are saved. Remember all the points of salvation, the eternal security of the believer? One of those building blocks we just looked at a moment ago. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain, there is a false salvation, a counterfeit. Remember we talked about that counterfeit salvation just a moment ago. Paul covers a lot of ground here in these four verses. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. It always goes back to the Bible. Here's your touchstone. If it's not in here, question it. If it's contradictory to this, 
deny it. If it's in compliance with it, with this, believe it and receive it. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. <clears throat> now I want you to think about this for just a second because this is what had been going on as the Apostle Paul for, spoke first in Jerusalem where the Jews hated him, wanting him killed. They tried to kill him in the temple. And remember, he got rescued by the Romans, carried up the stairs, preached to them. They hated that, that message <clears throat> and finally got dragged inside, was about to be tormented, tortured, and then he told them he was a Roman citizen, so they knew they had a problem on their hands. And eventually winds up before Felix and then Festus and then Agrippa and Bernice. We're going to see that in the next part of the text. And finally he gets to Caesar because God had told him, you're going to get to Rome, you're going to get to Caesar. Ah, how God directs our lives. Taking us places which perhaps if we knew everything in advance, we would not want to go in the flesh. But let's examine this for just a second. Those elements of the gospel that are listed. Even the most hard-hearted, unbelieving, God-hating pagan will not resist when you tell him that Christ died. That's all you tell him. Christ died. You know, he'll accept that because, you know, death is the fate of all men. He'll begin to quibble with you when you tell him that Christ died for his sins. Because you see, he doesn't actually believe that sin exists and <laughs> he certainly does not believe that he is a sinner. He wants to think that he's good. But when you tell him that Christ rose from the dead as proof that he died for our sins and that his sacrifice was accepted by God the Father as the basis for our salvation, the pagan God-hater will turn red in the face. He'll jump up and down. He'll scream blasphemies at you. Because the resurrection of Christ is something that the natural man will not and cannot accept because it destroys the very foundations of his miserable existence. That's the reason I don't use certain tracts. They talk about Christ dying for our sins, but they never mention the resurrection. They don't get you halfway there. How do you know he died for our sins? How do you know it was an acceptable sacrifice to God the Father? How do you know he didn't just die as a foolish Jewish criminal who sort of crossed the system at the wrong time in history? So I don't use those tracks. Even though much of what they say about the death of Christ is true, but if they don't mention the resurrection, they haven't given you the key to reach a man for Christ. That's why you always must emphasize the resurrection of Christ when you're presenting the gospel. Because only the Christ of Scripture, that is the risen Christ, can save a man from his sins. A dead Christ cannot save anybody. Now you know, there are some places in the world, even today, where churches are allowed to preach about the death of Christ, but they are absolutely forbidden to preach about his resurrection. Yeah, it's true, even today. Why? The resurrection not only gives life. Now, here's the key word I mentioned a few minutes ago, at the beginning of this message. The resurrection gives hope for the future. The resurrection gives hope for the future. For example, Mormon countries, or excuse me, um, not Mormons, Muslims. <laughs> Muslim countries talk about Jesus as one of the great prophets, though they believe that Muhammad is greater. But they don't believe in the resurrection because the Quran says that Jesus didn't really die. It says that it only appeared that Jesus died, but somebody else actually took his place and died there. So if Jesus didn't die, how could he rise from the dead? There are practical implications in the terms of population control also. You see, if people have hope for the future, they are far less likely to be docile and easy to control by governmental authorities. A lot of Christians have given up hope in light of the current political choices that seem to be available for this upcoming election. Never give up hope. We serve a risen Christ a Christ who is coming again. 
You see, this is foundational for the way in which we live, even in troublous political times. Never give up hope because Christ not only died for our sins, there's a very personal practical application, but Christ is risen from the dead and that has implications that shatter all of the beliefs of the world and change everything in terms of what we actually see going on around us because we know the future. Very soon we'll be celebrating the 4th of July. As with the American War for Independence, there was a hope in the colonies for freedom from the oppression that Great Britain had been giving to them based on political realities. In the New Testament, the Jewish leaders rightly perceived that the doctrine of the resurrection was causing them, and here is the issue, the doctrine of the resurrection was causing them to lose their grip of control over the people. Why? Because the resurrection gives hope. You remember what it said back in Matthew chapter 27? Now the day, the next day that followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Do you understand it? <laughs> the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, understood what Jesus was talking about. The disciples didn't get it, even after the resurrection took place. They were hiding out. Jesus had been with them. You know, he not only chose guys who were just sort of manual laborer types, he chose some guys who were pretty thick. I mean, the intellectual geniuses of the day, the guys who'd made it to the top in political power by all their manipulations and cunning and craftiness and how well they did on their exams through us. Uh, rabbinical school, those were the guys that were up there at the top. They got it. They knew what he was talking about. They knew that he would prophesied he was going to rise from the dead. They understood that when Jesus said, destroy this temple and after three days I will raise it again. They got the vibes. And now, because they knew what he said, they're coming and saying, we're going to keep it from happening. They came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore. <laughs> we saw that you could take him out. Now let's keep him out. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day. It's interesting. Here they go. Who was it that came? the chief priests and the Pharisees. Now there's a difference between Pharisees and Sadducees. Pharisees said they believed in the resurrection. Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection or in the spirit world. They were the humanists of the days. But who is asking for the stone to be sealed and by their very actions and words prove that what they claimed to believe was not true. The chief priests, those were Sadducees, and Pharisees came unto Pilate. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. You see, they had an agenda. The agenda was control. They claimed to believe something, but when they were actually faced with it, they wanted to keep it from happening because it would mean they lost control. Pilate said unto them, You have a watch. Go your way. Make it as sure as you can. And he was probably thinking to himself, Man, why did I get stuck in this territory ruling this particular group of weird people? Now, when they were going, behold, this is later in chapter 28. You know all that happens. They seal the sepulcher. The angel comes, rolls the stone away from the door of the sepulcher. The, the, the guards become like dead men. The women are able to get in. But now 
Some of the watch is coming into the city. Chapter 28, verse 11. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel. In other words, everybody was there, including Pharisees. They gave large money unto the soldiers. The Pharisees didn't say, wow, it actually happened. That proves that you Sadducees are wrong. That proves that Jesus is the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament. That proves that Psalm 16 was actually talking about a resurrection from the dead. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt I suffer thine holy one to see corruption. That proves Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant who at the end of the passage, after he's dead, is alive again at the end of Isaiah 53. They knew those passages. They claimed to believe in the resurrection. But Jesus threatened their power. They didn't oppose the Sadducees. They're among the group that comes. They're among the group that takes counsel together. They're among the group that bribes the soldiers. They gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. Boy, talk about putting yourself in jeopardy. It must have been very large money. I mean, soldiers are risking their lives for money. How much money would it take to get you to deny that Jesus rose from the dead? You say to yourself, you shrug your shoulders and say, hey, you know, I can still believe it in my heart. You can shrug your shoulders and say, uh, hey, I can go along with this. Look at this. I can retire. Ten million bucks? It's like the lottery? What is it? $250 million or something? All I have to do is just, you know, pass around a little rumor. Say Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, but I really believe it in my heart. How much money would it take for you to risk your life just to say Jesus didn't rise from the dead? You see, if they said they had fallen asleep on watch, they were risking their lives because that was the death penalty. How much money? It's interesting, the text doesn't tell us. But it does tell us something about the character of the soldiers. The soldiers had seen the angel roll the stone away. They had felt the ground tremble. They saw Christ come out of the tomb. It says they were like dead men. It would take a lot of money to make hardened soldiers pass a rumor that could cost them their life. It tells us something about the character of the soldiers, where their focus was. My dad used to tell the story of a young woman, a Christian woman, who claimed that she was morally pure, and she wouldn't commit immorality for any reason at all. And an older man who came along and asked her to sleep with him. She said, absolutely not. I'm a Christian. He said, well, how about I give you a thousand bucks? She said, no, no, I certainly wouldn't do that. He was very wealthy. He said, how about 10,000? She said, no. He opened his checkbook and showed her that he had more than a million dollars in it. He says, I'll give you a million dollars if you'll sleep with me. She hesitated, looked at the checkbook, and then said, well, okay. He said, well, how about for 500000 She says, well, what do you think I am? He said, we've already determined that. Now we're just haggling on the price. 
What do you really believe? The Apostle Paul was willing to die for the resurrection. The soldiers obviously were not. They went on, and if this come to the governor's ears, when we will persuade him and secure you. In other words, they had a lot of money. You think about all the Jews coming from all over the world, bringing the tithes of their income and depositing it at the temple. Yes, the Sanhedrin had a lot of money. They could have brought, probably bought the state of New Jersey several times over. They've been collecting that money for centuries. If this come to the governor's ears, you know what? We can pay him off too. We know the governor. We know what motivates him. He's a humanist. He doesn't think in terms of the long-range future. He thinks about right now. We'll bribe the soldiers, and then we'll bribe the governor. So they took the money and did as they were taught, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Let me point you to something else here in our text tonight. Not only is the resurrection the key issue, and why it is still the key issue, but because the resurrection of Christ gives hope for the future, it is closely tied to the literal bodily return of Christ at the rapture and then at the second coming. You see, the resurrection is a bodily resurrection. So we're not looking forward to some kind of a spiritualized return of Christ. We're not looking for some kind of an allegorical return of Christ. We're looking for a literal bodily return of Christ. That's why the rapture is called the blessed hope. You see, the resurrection gives hope for the future. And so the second coming, the, the rapture of the church, is called the blessed hope. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us, here's what controls our lives. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, because there is a future hope. Christ rose from the dead. That gives you hope. That gives you hope for the future. That gives you a reason for living a morally pure, holy, godly, fruitful life, totally dedicated, totally sold out to Jesus Christ. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The appearing of Christ is called the blessed hope. He's talking about the future. He's talking about that being the motivation for holy living who gave himself for us. Ah, he goes back to the cross and the resurrection, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That takes us back to those 16 key building blocks that we talked about in relation to salvation. That those who have truly believed will manifest forth their salvation by what they do. They're not saved by their works but their salvation automatically because they're alive and they are growing. Their salvation is going to show forth in the way that they live their works that they have, in fact, believed. Look at chapter 2, verse 15, the very next verse. This is why Paul was not afraid to stand before Felix and Festus and the council and even ultimately Caesar these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Titus had a good role model in the Apostle Paul. Now I talked about how in some parts of the world today you can talk about the death of Christ. Nobody cares. They may quibble with you when you talk about the death of Christ for sins. But 
they won't let you preach about the resurrection. Did you know that's also why they suppress the doctrine of the victorious return of Christ? It's an issue of control. Hope makes people unafraid to share the gospel because they know the best is yet to come. That's why the doctrine of the resurrection and the return of Christ is such a fearful thing to pagans who have an insatiable desire to control people. They must keep those people always believing that there is no hope. A man without hope will not jeopardize his life. A man without hope will do what he is told to do and not rock the boat. A man without hope thinks only of his own temporal, miserable existence. But a man with hope is willing to stand up and be counted. A man with hope is willing to die so that others might live. A man with hope is willing to speak boldly to and against those who oppress others. The gospel with its core doctrine of the resurrection, gives hope. It's easy to see in our text tonight why the Jewish leaders were so rabidly and desperately trying to get the Romans to kill Paul, or at the very least put Paul in a situation where they could assassinate him themselves. Paul preached the resurrection, and that was threatening their control of the people. I can't believe our time is up. Well, at least let me mention the second thing that's in the text. The first thing was about the resurrection and all the implications that that has for the Christian life. The second main thing to notice in our text tonight is that pagan leaders are trying to solve a spiritual problem. <laughs> and that, of course, is impossible. But I don't have time to develop that one tonight, so we'll have to save that for next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. That's what gives us hope for the future. That's what gives us an earnest anticipation and eagerness for the rapture. That's what gives us hope in the midst of politically uncertain times and decadence and depravity and wickedness all around us. There is hope because Christ is risen from the dead. And because he is risen from the dead, we know that he's coming again. And because we know he's coming again, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. It's the motivation for living a holy life. Father, instead of looking at the world around us, instead of listening to the temptations of the world, the flesh, the devil, and the demons, all those things that titillate our flesh and stimulate us to the lusts of the world, Father, help us to remember Christ risen and coming again. What a change it will make in our lives, the way that we think, the words that we speak, the actions that we take, the attitudes that we have, the motivations that compel us forward. But those compellings can be in one direction or in another. Let the resurrection and return of Christ be the motivation that compels us forward. And then glorify your Son in us and through us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I told you that that resurrection.